welcome back to the True to Form podcast. I am your host, Audrey Neff, and we are welcoming back someone um, who actually had the most downloaded episode of season six. And I am that I, as of the metrics this morning, um, that still holds to be true. Um, who is Fran Akunzo? So he, for those of you guys know, he is a industry OG veteran, knows this industry probably better than anybody. And he is the co-founder and CEO of Akara Partners. Um, they do a lot with new business development, help launch new practices. He is also the president of Princeton Med Spa Partners. Um, they are an investment group that is acquiring med spas. And then he also has, they also have the franchise component with um, Med Spa A10 as well. So given that Fran's episode, and for those of you guys who have not chimed into it, I strongly encourage you to, it was the state of medical aesthetics in 2023. So that was really part one. So we're bringing Fran back on for part two. So because there are so many things that have happened just in that time frame in terms of where the industry is, um, the economic impact, where it is going, what does the future look like? And there are just so many things that we're going to be covering today. And I'm so excited to welcome him back as a guest. So before we jump into today's power packed episode, Fran, welcome back to True to Form. Thank you, Audrey. <laughs> It's great to be back here to talk more yeah. about the industry. Yes, you're like our industry celebrity. So it's wonderful to have <laughs> you back on the True to Form podcast. We, are, we do not repeat guests often. So well, <laughs> you I are feel so privileged. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, but we're very grateful to have you. So a lot of you guys probably have noticed um, over the last year, let's say, there's been tons of things happening in the industry, both exciting and maybe a little um, uncertain, let's say. So lots of exciting things going on in terms of industry growth, um, market size, projected continual compound annual growth rate through 2027. I mean, if we look at just estimated med spas from the last um, AM spa state of the industry report, it was almost 9,000. If we go to med data from Medical Insights in 2022, it was a $17.8 billion global industry. And we will see that double digit growth um, continual, um, continuing on, we definitely have low market penetration. We're seeing a lot of, and this is where I kind of want to start the conversation today, Fran, is obviously there's a lot of things that are going to be driving growth. Um, low market penetration, I, I believe it's around on only seven and a half percent of the total addressable market have even had some type of injectable. Like it's extremely yeah. low and people think the market's saturated. It's not saturated. Tons of room for everybody yeah. to be successful. Um, but something that is very, very prominent that unless you live under a rock, I'm sure all of us have been seeing is what we refer to as industry consolidation. And I'm going to let Fran unpack this because it's going to, it's, it's very prominent in our industry and it's not going away. It's just getting started. So one of the major thing that, things that will be driving growth is consolidation. And if you look at the industry, it's a very fragmented industry. Very few practices compared to the whole number have been quote unquote consolidated, um, which would really equate to being, you know, backed by an investment group, PE, a franchise, or some type of de novo build, let's say. So Fran, I'm going to let you kind of take it from here because so much has been going on with the industry. It's an exciting time for all of us, but we all are seeing the investment community kind of trickle in and franchises open up every single day in the medical aesthetic yeah. industry. So you are obviously super knowledgeable about this. So please talk to us about what has been going on since the last time that we talked to you back in March? Okay. Well, franchises continue to grow. Um, I don't know of any really new players right now on the franchise side that have jumped in the market, but the ones that are in the market already, um, mm -hmm. such as Met by 10 and um, uh, VO and a few of the others, they've continued to grow and have been yep. successful. So we see that happening. We know that's part of the growth part of the consolidation. What we really see happening is the private investment groups, whether they be private equity or just a collective group of private investors, mm -hmm. um, grow through consolidation, grow the industry through consolidation. They are going out paying what I consider fair prices yep. uh, for these med spas. And uh, it, 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 it was the, the timing was right because people who have opened med medical spas, own medical spas, they're at the point of retirement. They're at the point where 
they've got into it, but decided, you know, I'm a provider. I, I don't want to be a business person. And so, you know, after five years or seven years or whatever, they're, they want out. Um, so there are many locations that want to be consolidated. Um, they don't have to worry about the marketing. They don't have to worry about the accounting. They don't have to worry about bulk purchasing, all taken care of for them. They have to worry about providing great service to their clientele. Uh, and so that's what makes it so attractive and why so many people are jumping in. I would say the last time we spoke, I think our group, which is Princeton Med Spa Partners, had three or four locations. Mm -hmm. uh, now we have 10 locations and we have nice. about seven letters of intent okay. that are out there that will close probably in the early part of 2024. Uh, so we are continuing to grow and, and grow fairly rapidly, uh, which is which is very exciting. Uh, so that's that's where I guess you, you can say growth, but the growth is not because of the consolidation. The growth is because the industry continues to grow. Mm -hmm. uh, injectables is, you know, a great area where you see growth because like you said, 7% market saturation, that's it. So there's yeah. still so much more room and especially the younger market on injectables. They're jumping in the 25 year old to 35 year old, that age range and younger, uh, yep. jumping in to have injectables done for lips and other parts of the face for fillers, uh, less on the Botox, but even so, there's still, there's still a certain amount of Botox. Um, and that's where we see the growth. In, yeah the market size is growing and it continues yes. to grow. Consolidators are, maybe they're a little bit better than an individual performer because mm -hmm. they're able to look at 10 locations at once and see what's going on. Uh, so they can spur that growth from 7% to a 10% growth. So you'll see a little bit growth from there, but primarily it's because of the market size just expanding, yep. which is really exciting. Yes, it's so exciting. We've obviously seen consolidation happens in most industries, you know, and an industry continues to grow. The investment community take notes um, when they see it's a recession resilient industry. Not, no, nothing's recession proof, but resilient, of course. Yep. And so I want to go into something a little bit deeper that you touched on. So consolidated groups you, you mentioned are, let's say, better, more effective at operating the practices yes. and having a better you know, bottom line at the end of the day. So I want to go into this topic first is because, and this is, this is just good education for all of our listeners. Um, but a solo practice, and I, I don't want to be negative, but a solo practice is going to definitely have, or let me actually reword this. Someone that's a part, a practice that is a part of a group, whether it's PE, whether it's a franchise, whatever it may be, they're going to have additional resources, training, and let's say expertise and experience that your solo med spa starting up is not necessarily going to have. So I think it'd be really awesome for our listeners, Fran, if you could unpack kind of like the key, some of the key benefits um, sure. that these types of practices have when they are backed. Definitely will. Um, you know, successful businesses, especially in consolidations, are not born through corporations. They're born through passionate entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And in a consolidation, you keep the passion, right? A corporation does not come with any passion. They come with statistics and our, uh, KPIs and and all of those other good things that you need. Yeah. And you don't have time for when you're a passionate individual practitioner trying to run your business, but also trying to um, be a, a good provider or a good manager. So in comes say a PE group or a private investment group, they have um, high level marketing where there's a, you know, a marketing director who's or a VP of marketing whose sole focus is on how to market a medical spa. Right? Yeah. 
they are the expert, just like you were the expert in injectables. You being the universal you, it's the expert in injectables. Mm -hmm. um, they are also, they have accounting and they are able yeah. to, that is just where you take away the work. So the location just doesn't have to be worrying about it. So the burden of, I've got to close my books. I've got to get, make sure that everything's being accounted for properly. That's taken away. Uh, they have group buying. I mean, you mm -hmm. can't go to Allergan and say, hey, look, here I have $10 million I need this year when you're a single practitioner. There's very few, if any, of single practitioners that buy that much and more uh, from a group like Allergan, MERS, Galderma. Um, so you have that benefit as well. And they can negotiate and get more points off of the... Um, uh, the cost of goods, which drop right to the bottom line, thus improving yeah. the bottom line. Yeah. Coming in with software and patient now is such a great example. You do multi-site so well, probably one of the best in the industry, and they can come in with a patient now, collectively put it all together. And by looking at all of the locations at the same time, as far as sales numbers and cost numbers, you can just improve uh, yeah. that much better. You have locations, uh, best practices. You have locations with best practices. You can take those best practices and you can spread them throughout the whole system mm -hmm. you know, that you couldn't do as a sole practitioner. So there's so many benefits from a financial standpoint um, and from a personal standpoint in being part of, cons of a consolidation. Uh, it, you can often these consolidations allow you to stay in so you can roll in equity and yep. maintain 20 percent ownership where the next time they sell could be five years from now you make that much more because they were doing it that much better mm -hmm. uh, so it's very attractive and the fact is during those five years you didn't worry about that stuff you worried about the next client coming in the door and making yeah. sure they were taken care of whether you're a provider or a manager. Yeah, definitely. And I I want you to go a little into, because you, you touched on something that I think is a big value add. Um, for people that are in, let's say they've been open for a while, they're considering retiring, exiting their business, and they're like, okay, what am I going to do? Who am I going to sell it to? How do I choose who is the right partner? Let's use that term for yep. my practice and they just don't really know where to start. Like what would be your advice to them? You know, it, it, it really comes down to take a look at what industry expertise they have. So they're, they're not coming in as a group with no industry expertise. They understand your business or at least yeah. there's people within the organization that understand your business and they're sensitive to the needs of the business. That's really important. Yeah. Take a look, of course, at price. You know, but price isn't everything, especially if you're rolling in equity. Yep. Because mm -hmm. if there's industry expertise that is going to help prove you success or make you successful, more successful over time, you're going to make more money on the equity you, you rolled in. So that's really important. So price, is it important? Yes, but, you know, they're all going to price around the same amount. It's not as if one is going to be $5 million right. and the other is going to give you $9 million. Uh, yeah. It really doesn't happen that way. One might be $5 million, the other $5.7 million. All right, that's first thing to look at. Second thing, who's on the team? Talk to the people they sold to. Find out from them how smoothly the transaction went. Make sure they can transact because we've seen it where they put in offers, they go through a due diligence process and they're not capable or able to transact at the end. Really important. And you learn that by talking to the people they've already transact, transacted with. Yeah. And also if, if I recall correctly, when you, when Princeton's acquiring, um, these practices, you guys aren't rebranding them necessarily. You guys are still letting them yeah. operate with the brand that initially made them successful in the first place. Correct. The two, the two things that we're really buying 
is brand and team. You put the yeah. brand and the team together, that's what you get the clientele, right? Yep. And that's how you keep the clientele. So we go in, the two most precious items that are in a business are take care of that team and cherish the brand. Yeah. So that's that's our approach. Yeah, absolutely. And and obviously it's working. It's it's amazing. And congrats to you guys to see that, you know, the last time we talked, um, you know, it was a couple. And now yeah. you guys have 10 locations and seven letters of intent. So you guys are you're on the rise. It's it's so exciting to see. And and obviously just knowing you and know the expertise that you bring to the industry, you guys are obviously a phenomenal um group to to partner with, to um, you know, exit your business with, roll over that equity. I thought you touched on some really powerful points. So it, looking for someone you're gonna sell to, let's say in simple terms, right? Industry expertise, big, totally, totally agree. Like the medical spa industry, like medical spas is a very complex business. If you think about it, it really like it, it really is because there's the medical component of it. If that medical was ripped out of there, it'd be a much more simpler, less complex business. But because we have that medical component, it's actually a complex business. So finding the right investment groups, whether they're PE backed or not, to partner with, let's say, um, to sell your business to, and you stay on contractually, you have equity that rolls over and that's all great. But finding someone that is specialized in this industry, because it is a very complex industry, um, talking to the team culture, like too, like you want to partner with someone who's going to have a similar culture to the way that you run your own practice. So I, I, I love that you said the two things you are buying, you're not buying the practice, like you're buying that brand yeah. that they've built over time and their team. And I just hearing that, um, you know, I think that's such a big selling point um, to anyone that's in their exit stage, they're looking to retire because that is big. And I feel like a lot of times certain groups can, they buy and then they just kind of rip everything just, out. That, that yeah, was they move on or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, as an entrepreneur, these are small entrepreneurial owners, and yeah. those are the two things that are important to them. The ones that are successful realized along the way that it was all about the team and it was all about the brand. Yeah. Uh, and they held the torch for those two things and focused in that direction. And, and they were very successful, and those are the ones we want to buy, our successful yeah. medical, medical spas. Definitely. And I'm actually yeah. curious now, too, like when you guys are – look i assume practices reach out to you guys every day um, obviously you have a big name in the industry what are some specific things obviously even on stuff like that but like beyond that like inside the practice i'm curious how you guys go about i don't want to say interviewing but how you go through that process of learning about the inner workings of the practice it, uh, you know there's a series of due diligence so we do all of the practical items tax due diligence yeah uh, we do um, financial due diligence, thus we prove out the numbers they presented in their financial statements were mm -hmm. accurate, true and accurate. Uh, we conduct marketing due diligence and we conduct operating due diligence. So we go in see, and we don't interface with the team because typically the team doesn't know we're right. acquiring. Yep. You know, it's, it's kept quiet and it should be kept quiet. Yeah. If something falls apart in the very end, in the 11th hour, you don't want the team thinking that all they want to do is sell. It's, yep. it's not a good feeling. So um, you have to work with the owner and get the information from the owner. Sometimes yeah. the owner will, will bring in the manager in confidence. Um, yeah. I worry a little bit sometimes also when right. they do because how, how confidential is that person? Um, but it's, it's really the operating and the marketing due diligence is through a series of questions. It's a very lengthy questionnaire um, that we, we like to do in person more than just having him fill it out um, because it goes down lots of different paths mm -hmm. when you're having these questions. And you're trying to find out on the operating side, especially um, you're trying to learn about the people and uh, what, what we're up against. And there's the good, we take the good and the bad. We don't come in and, and hatch at anybody. That's not our approach. You know, this location was for buying a successful location. It's successful because of who was there. Yeah. And 
the team as they operate, but we need to know how that, that was so we can continue to help them operate it as well as possible. Um, yeah. Is also um, a natural background information is checked, of course, on everybody. Um, and so he has fairly a thorough process uh, that we go through. And it's a lot of discussion with the current owner on all different levels, financial, marketing, operations, mm -hmm. facility, learning about the facility. It's not that we're not going to buy because of certain things, but we just need our eyes wide open going in, knowing that in a year the air conditioning has to be fixed or whatever mm -hmm. the situation may be. So or what we're up against. Yeah. And I'm curious now, um, when you are looking at practices, how big of a role does it play? And this is just me being curious is if in terms of let's just call it scalable technology practices that are, let's say paper charting versus using an EMR system. I'm just a little curious around how much that plays a role in your decision making process to acquire businesses. It doesn't. We will take on a practice that is paper charting. Okay. Um, again, it goes back to if you have a $2 million practice and they're consistently doing a half a million dollars in EBITDA, mm -hmm. even with paper charts, they're yep. consistently doing a half a million dollars in EBITDA. Yep. Now, will we work to change that? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Over time, though, yeah. the last thing you do to a practice is walk in the door and have them go from paper into a computer, uh, yeah. you know, it, it just into uh, an EMRM system immediately it, it, because it shakes everything up too much. You're probably going to wait six months. You're probably going to then figure out a plan. You're going to yes. involve the team on site. They're going to be the ones doing it. So, yeah. Yeah, I was just curious because I hear yeah. different things from from different people. So I just wanted to get your perspective on it. And Some so kind of cringe at a paper, you know, paper mm -hmm. practice. I don't. Yeah. So. I mean, yeah, if it's all about your if it's doing the money. It's doing the money. right? It's mm -hmm. absolutely. <laughs> and we all know moving from paper to EMR is a process. It's stressful. It's we all get it. Yeah. Um, but I guess on that point now, because obviously we do know that you guys have implemented patient now in a lot of your locations. And, and I'm very, we're very appreciative of the kind words um, that you, um, you know, I've said that we do multi-site well, which, which I love. I think we actually work with, um, we actually have two clients right now that are now franchising. Um, so I think we're around six or seven franchise clients now that patient now will be affiliated with. That's so great. we're so grateful for all of our amazing um, partners um, such as you guys. And, and of course the other ones we work with as well. And I, I, Love something you said, because you were talking about how when you're a part of a group, whether it's a franchise, whether it's, you know, the investment group, Prince MS, well, whatever it is, you are kind of a part of like a community too. And you talked about how you you're sharing best prep, like you guys have all this expertise, you know, it works well. You can look at one location that's absolutely killing it. What are they doing so well that maybe some of our other locations and practices might not be doing? Yeah, and, and what's really exciting, on Fridays, we have a, a manager's meeting. And mm -hmm. one of the focuses of that meeting is to share best practices Love and it. to exchange what is working, what's not working, whether it be from marketing to operations, so that all of the managers in the system can adopt um, as they do it. So that's that's been very successful. And it's it's exciting for the managers because mm -hmm. it keeps it, it keeps life in the system. All right, that's great. I I want to I want to implement that now, and I want to see growth uh, at the front desk based on how they're handling phone calls. Um, you know that location has a call center. I'm going to implement a call center. Mm -hmm. uh, that sort of thing. That's yeah. You know one example actually, and it, it, that's been done already yeah i love it and that, that's so cool to hear um because collaborating together goes a long way especially for the groups such as you you guys that are prioritizing that 
um, with all the practices you acquire. And I love that you hold those 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 meetings. I, th I think that's awesome. And that just speaks to the culture too, going back to the top and the leadership. So yes. I there's a lot of things I want to get through. Um, and I think the order we're going to go through is I want to touch because we kind of started talking about software a bit. So what I want to while we're still kind of on this topic, and then I want to go into like health and like device health, treatment health, um, in terms of like treatments, lasers, EBD sector, all that stuff, economy and predictions. But before we jump into that, and that's definitely a topic we'll end with because it's going to be a great topic, is marketing. So I know in addition to patient, you guys are also implementing and onboarding our RX Photo um, plus social integration package, which, you know, yes. RX Photo handles your before and afters. And then we have an integration that goes into Canva to assist with social media. And then there's a reputation management component apart from that too. So I, I want to hear your insight since you launched, you know, probably almost 200 practices at this point or around that more, more, on the more. marketing side, like what are, where has, from a consumer perspective, like where are we at in terms of marketing? Like what really do practices have to be doing literally every day if they want to see success with it. So we're seeing a shift. Um, we were heavy on pay-per-click Google AdWords. Yeah. Um, we're still doing Google AdWords. There is still a place for it, but it's migrating now over to um, Facebook and Instagram, TikTok ads, mm -hmm. and a heavy usage of video reels yes. right so we're seeing this migration that people are looking for and along with that and sort of ties in our google reviews or just reviews in general yes. so they're looking for that organic information that you get with reels and you get with reviews they want to see what other people are saying they want to know if this is a good place or a bad place. You don't go to a restaurant without looking at reviews. Why would you go mm -hmm. to a med spa without looking at reviews? Mm -hmm. The reputation management and the review system is extremely important. Leaning on your social, especially Facebook and Instagram um, and use of video in your social is imperative at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't talk enough about that we akara as you know has a marketing team of uh, 15 or 16 people and a big part of what akara's marketing team does is social media well we're now finding that they are willing people it's become so important that they are willing to hire us to take our videographer and fly them to wherever they are in the country mm -hmm to do a B-roll to be used at Reels. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's just become very, is beginning to become very popular. Before it was, it was unheard of. Like who would spend that money? Yep. You wouldn't spend that kind of money, you know, whatever it would cost to, for the travel and the related plus then the fees. Uh, but now it's just too important. It's like, yeah. why spend 5,000 on pay-per-click when 5,000 of B-roll can get you mm -hmm. really far and a ton of reels when yes. you cut it off. Um, so that's that's where we see marketing moving towards. It's, it's you know, it, there's still a little bit of place for the traditional marketing. Sure. Um, and there's still a place for paid ads, but really it comes down to social. Newsletters, of course, still very strong. Um, additional web content like blogs, very mm -hmm. strong, but yes. those blogs have reels in them. You know, they're animated, they're live. They're, they're, it's not just a static page. It has something to look at. Yeah. Uh, or flip to or jump over to. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's really important. Yeah. Engaging. Couldn't agree more. The word engaging. Like reading a a post in a newsletter without anything is not really that engaging. Mm -hmm. It's somewhat, but when you have the ability to have the visual in there and they can listen to it and they can see it and then they can read it if they want to read it, that's great. Yeah. 
totally drive in the door. Yeah. And the one word that like sticks out at me engaging. Yeah. That that's the big thing. Um, and that's where we have certainly migrated over to, which is why these are all, th all everything you touched on is critical and they all play a different role and you need to be doing all of them. And I, I the word that keeps going back into my head is what's residual. So you mentioned PPC, like that's not residual because as soon as you stop paying Google, it stops, right? Yep. So you, you turn it on, turn it off. Exactly. So long-term, is that a long-term strategy? No, it's a short-term strategy to get leads in the door right away for whatever you buy a new piece of capital equipment, whatever it is, sure. But long-term that's not residual. So what, what is residual? Everything you just touched on, Fran, you said your social media, like your social media is archived there forever. So that yeah. is residual. And you like just having a content day, like you said, you know, practices paying money to have someone come out, video the whole day, get all this B-roll to archive, and you can create months worth of content and reels. Like that is a good use of money because those things that you're putting out into the social media world are residual. It's organic. They're going to stay there and they're going to continue to help drive business for you versus the PPC route. Um, reviews, so critical. And I'm so glad you brought up reviews because I feel like reviews is something practices so often just don't even think about. Do. And it's, <laughs> it's crazy to me because your reviews are the first place, just like you said, someone's going to go before they even go to your website. And you have to be active with them. You can't yes. like get 20 reviews and then say, okay, well, good. We're done. Yep. That looks, then it looks bad. It looks yes. like, why is this place been quiet for the past six months? Mm -hmm. You've just got to, to have a continual flow of reviews, even if it's just, they dwindle in, that's better than them stopping. So, you know, yes. if you have three or four a month, fine, but they're coming in consistently every month, yes. new reviews and take that and, 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 and the, the sharing of information on the internet and in, in every way in which you market your location is so important. You can take a real, it could be on your website. It could be in a blog. It could be on Insta, on Facebook. Um, a review can be on Insta, on Facebook, on your website, um, in your newsletter. Yeah. Uh, do things with it. This, this is all, yes. like I say, I call it fodder. It's fodder for the marketing machine. Um, yeah. Every piece of information you get, use it on all your communication yes. devices. Yes, yeah. for purpose, everything. Couldn't agree more on that. And yeah, like uh, even on the reviews thing, I feel like something else I want to add is, is everyone going to get a negative review at some point? Yeah, like no one's perfect. And yeah. the only way to level the playing field with that is to constantly have positive reviews pumping out in your practice that are consistent to kind of level that back down. And I, exactly. yeah. And negative reviews, they will lose you business if you don't have a strategy in place of constantly pushing out those positive yep. reviews. Yep. And but also, one negative um, review yeah. against 10 positive, that's not, yes. no one looks at that and says, oh, I shouldn't go there. They look at the nine positive and say, oh, yes, this is good. This person didn't have a good experience, but nine yeah. people did. Exactly. Exactly. And like people know that people know everyone's going to get a negative review. Like, honestly, from my perspective, if I saw a business that had 500 reviews and there was not one negative. Don't, don't you worry. Like sketchy. Yeah. yeah. Like I'm like, uh, this seems this. like fake and disingenuous and not authentic, <laughs> which is why like people should, you guys are everyone listening. Like you're going to get a negative review. It's a okay. It yeah. happens. Whether it was a bad, whether it was your fault as the practice or a crazy right. patient, whatever it is, you know, if you just have that strategy in place of continually pushing out reviews from the people who love you in your practice, and if done the right way of the right technology in place, you yeah. ask in a genuine and authentic way, you will drive more reviews. I couldn't agree more because reviews are, it's like, just like you said, it's organic things that people are looking at now, social media reviews, SEO. Yeah. That's, that's critical to rank your website or specifically yeah. pages within your website. Yep. Yeah. Um, and don't be afraid to ask for the reviews. And that's yeah. where that really just, I cringe yes. when I hear somebody say, I'm not going to ask because then you get negative and you get positive. Like, 
No, you are going to ask. You're going to ask consistently. Yes. And every new person that walks in your door, you should ask. Yes, and, absolutely. And I, if you're doing your job right, nine out of 10 times will be a positive for you. Yeah, totally agree. And just maybe this comes back to like a training perspective too. Like you have a talk track in place. So this is when we're going to ask patients for reviews. This is how we're going to ask them, you know, just asking in a genuine and authentic way saying, you know, yeah. Susan, it's your skin looks phenomenal. Oh my gosh. It's been wonderful to treat you. You know, in the next hour or two, you're going to be receiving an email text message from our practice asking you to review us. It would mean the world to us. If you would like review our business on Google, it would just mean everything. Like if you just ask. If something happened that they didn't like, when you're asking, they'll tell you. Yes. And we'll fix it before it gets to a negative review. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the best part about it. And exactly. same thing even with reviews when you send it out. When somebody comes back and says something negative, before it gets public, you have a chance to fix it. Yeah. So. Absolutely. Just a way to be proactive with, with yep. your business too. So, I mean, just for everyone listening, Fran broke it down perfectly. If you're not, if you don't have a review strategy in place and just go to your Google reviews right now, you can see, just see what you have. If you have 20, you have a lot of work to do. If you have a hundred plus, you're on the right train, looking, but don't stop. Good. Like, yeah, yeah, looking good from a consumer perception too. like triple digits is just what instantly builds more trust. And it it, sure that would go for anyone like 56 compared to 256. Look at your competitors. Yeah. and see how many reviews and what level of stars they have. If they're yeah. showing 180 reviews, 4.3 stars, mm -hmm. you, know, you better you have some work to do. catch up and you better get at least a 4.3 or greater. Yes, if you want to definitely. Absolutely. Great points. And I promise you a ton of our listeners are probably like, oh, crap. Like looking at yeah. their Google reviews right now, because I, I I just see it all the time, and they could be the an incredible provider. Yeah. But their reviews don't reflect that, and unfortunately, in the reality we live in, back to business. It yeah, it's gonna lose you business, especially when you start talking about the millennial generation too. Like millennials read reviews and they look at photos. Those are like two of the biggest things, and yep. it, they just. They trust reviews and photos of complete strangers and some people that might rub them the wrong way, but that's just the that's how reality is. of the world that we live in. And yeah. actually now on the millennial topic, um, cause this kind of moves me over to, let, let's talk a little bit about the services, treatments of the different sectors in the industry. Primarily let's do like EBD. So energy-based devices and injectables, like those are obviously two core segments of the medical aesthetic industry yes. what have you seen in terms of like things that are trending or innovations um in both of those sectors maybe we start with injectables first and then we'll go into energy based devices anything that you see that's been changing um with the entrance of younger generations yeah, to coming definitely. into the market um with the entrance of younger groups and that is for sure happening um yeah. we definitely see people being more Adventurous. Before the individual, the older individual that knew Botox wants Botox. But there's a lot of toxins on the market now. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of fillers on the market. And there's more and more um, as time goes on. And it's the younger market that's willing to try something new. Yeah. Um, you know, wrestling, not wrestling. Um, which is a filler, but uh, Juvederm, I believe it's Juvederm who's um, trademark. Oh, Jabot? Yes. So, you know, uh, these things are, are the, the market size is not only getting bigger, but as it gets bigger, it's not just focused on on Allergan. Nothing against Allergan. Yeah. They're still the BAM off right. in the market. You know, mm -hmm. they still got it down and they still were the first to market. Of course. So that's, that's of course. their position. But yeah. there are other things coming on the market that people are liking to use or like they like to use and their consumers are saying, sure, they're willing before I, I found resistance and it was difficult to enter the market with a new filler or a new inject, a uh, new uh, toxin that's gone away. Yeah. Um, I think that, 
uh, that's going to help. Now, is it going to be a big part of the growth? Not for the moment, but it's going to be some of the growth, you know, 10, 15 percent at least, um, where you have the big hitters, the Allergan, Scaldermas, MERS, where all most of the growth is is happening versus the new entries. Yeah. So Definitely. that's that, that's exciting there. And on the laser front, you know, we see Halo and Moxie being really strong, and their brand names are beginning to more so than beginning. They're really being used. I want a Halo. I want a Moxie. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is just one company that puts those out, but right. they're being asked for by brand. Yes. Uh, which the only other time that I can think of. Um, where it was so prevalent was cool sculpting. People ask for cool sculpting. Yeah. Um, and they're now asking for Moxie. They're now asking for Halo as a brand. Yeah, definitely. But, I would also, but, I, I think Morpheus has also kind of become a brand. Morpheus, like how Yes, definitely. Yeah. That, that, that one too. All right, we've seen. Mm-hmm. Um, Yep, there's there's a few, not too many. There's, it's it's no, surprisingly many. less than you'd expect. Yeah. Um, but so th- that's it's interesting, uh, the growth there and the, the, you know their their numbers are somewhat public because they're gonna they're going right. public at some point. Yeah. And they've grown. Uh, Cyton has grown tremendously in the past. They really years. have. Yeah. It's- it's been crazy to see. It's just been, and what's interesting, and this goes back to something we were already talking about, was a lot of these brands, let's say, that start ramping up their household brand name recognition and consumers are asking for it. A lot of it stems from like social media, going back to the importance yeah. of social media, whether a company is using like a, I don't want to say an influencer and they're bringing in celebrities or whatever it may be, but all these like oh, things, are coming from social media. Yeah, so I know Sidon one- has a whole department, you know, their concierge department, they call it. They focus on their clients, but they also focus on themselves. And so much of it is about social media. Yeah. And, and wow. So it's pretty incredible. Something else I want to touch on too, because we're definitely seeing the industry as we become more innovative and more players start coming into this space, which is something that's so exciting about this industry. And another reason it will continue to grow is innovation overall. You know, I think Evelis has done a really good job at targeting Javo specifically to millennials. I think yeah. that that com- obviously they are not going to have as much market share as Galderma or Allergan no, or MERS, it's but the they picked the nation. Yeah, and a target market, and they went they went after it, and I think it's been really cool um, to yeah. see that as well. Then we had Daxify come in last year from Rovance. Right. I think it was last year. So, it was last year. Yep. Mm-hmm. The beginning. We have lots of yeah. innovation, and I think as we see the innovation, patients are now seeking more, or not even seeking, because this comes down to the practice effectively educating them. But we're seeing a big trend in combination therapy approaches as well. So talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, we see this, especially with uh, lasers, but also mm-hmm. with lasers and injectables. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you have your palate, which is your face. And it's one thing to, to get rid of reds and browns and wrinkles, but you then leave trenches or lines and things of that nature that can only be fixed with injectables. Yeah. So a, a doctor who's good at what they do or a practitioner is, that's good at what they do is making recommendations um, for combination treatments. So combining the halo with Allergan's products and mm-hmm. injectables. Um, so you're, you're sculpting the face but you're also re- remodeling it with laser and yep. a lot of that. Um, Definitely. There's, not, there's not one treatment that fixes somebody. Yep. There's usually like two, three, four treatments yes. that you need. Yep. Uh, so that's, that's, there alone expands the market because it expands how much we're doing in volume mm-hmm. in that. 
Absolutely. And also better patient results and then just more money for your practice too. Exactly. And better referrals. Yes. And Have photos, before and after photos. <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah. It I very stop. seldom see a before and after and they don't say, and then I went in with XYZ mm -hmm. after this. It's like, all right, so you did a combination treatment. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Treatment plans are big and yeah, having that combination therapy approach. Yeah. So, and this was a topic we had to cover today is the next thing. And we're going to, however long this takes us to get through, it was something we definitely need to talk about since we have the expert expert with us today. And Fran, this has been such a wonderful conversation. Um, I, I always I, learn a lot from you. So really let's talk about the state of the economy now. So obviously okay. we kind of talked about the industry, but now there's macroeconomic factors. Of course, it's been a wild couple of years, let's say, if you will. And it's a discussion we can't avoid talking about, right? No. It's always at top of mind. So from your standpoint, in terms of an economic impact, has there been any type of economic impact on the medical aesthetic industry? I have seen zero impact on the locations that do it well. Mm -hmm. I have seen impact on locations that are either not doing it well or they're getting skittish and they yeah. think, oh, I, I have to stop spending so much on marketing. We're going into a recession. Well, that you just stated the opposite when you say yeah. said that. <laughs> you have to spend a little bit more on marketing possibly mm -hmm. because we're going into a recession or at least yeah. the same. Um, so I, no, and I can pr predict, I can only predict for our lower and mid pricing because mm -hmm. back in the other, the last recession, 2008, nine, we didn't have more costly items in med spas. We had um, things that range from say $200 to $1,200. We saw no impact, the recession on those. Now, the cool sculpting and the neos, things that are costing three, four, five, six, yep, or more thousand. There's no history, so I, I can't predict that. Right. Um, I would hope that it doesn't it, it doesn't hurt as bad as you'd expect. Will it dip? Maybe, um, but your bread and butter won't. And yeah. I think that you have to lean on that. But whatever you do, just don't reduce your marketing spend. Don't mm -hmm. your attention to the public has got to be as strong or stronger than it was pre recession. If we end up in a recession, right? You know, it's still questionable what's going to happen moving forward. Yeah. Are we just going to glide through this like we are now and uh, pull out or are we going to go down into recession and then pull up, pull up. That's right. to be seen. So yeah, I, I just stay the course. I think that's the best advice I can give anybody. Yes. Just stay the course. You will do fine. Do not fret about the word recession, not in our industry. Yeah, I totally agree. And just to yeah, reiterate what you said, don't pull back on your marketing. And this was a lesson that should have already been learned back in 2020. For any practice yep. that was open that made that mistake, you're not going to make the yes, same mistake exactly. twice. That, that was kind of a, it wasn't to do with recession, but it was an artificial dip that yes. we should have, we could have all seen and, and, and yes. learned from. I totally agree. Yep. Stay the course. Couldn't agree more. Um, and yeah, you said the bread and butter, if you're doing things right in your practice, the bread and butter of aesthetics, which are going to be your injectables and lower cost treatments and things like that. And not that those are cheap, but no. cheaper than, as you said, like the more body sculpting, M sculpt, things like that, it, you know, because I think a big reason about that too, is because aesthetics has become honestly so mainstream for the people that have started like injectables, filler, monthly facials. Like once you start doing them, unless something horrible happens, you're going to do them the rest of your life because you know what you look like when you start doing them. <laughs> exactly. It's so true though. I mean, like I could never go without my tox. No way. <laughs> so, and I'm a very tox resistant human. I have to go like every two and a half months. It's quite unfortunate. And I tried Dax by that was not even effective for me either. But um, it, it, yeah, it'll be interesting to see 
how it evolves. But I, I, I think for the most part, people that are freaking out, like, don't like just stay the course, as Fran said, continue with your marketing, have a strategy in place, have the right systems in place, prioritize your reviews, prioritize your social media. I mean, we went through so many things. And a lot of these things are things that aren't necessarily expensive to do when it comes to like right. reviews and social, it just takes some time and a, being prioritized and just having the right systems in place. Not that it's free, but I mean, it, it's just something that needs to be strated, have a strategy in place, um, an effective strategy and then monitor and refine as you go. So I can't, every time I talk to you, Fran, it's like, goes by like that. So <laughs> we're already at know, the top already... of the hour. <laughs> Four minutes before three. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, oh my goodness. Wow. It time always flies. Um, and it's like when I'm when I'm always looking at you know topics, I'm like, oh yeah, this will probably be 30 minutes. Nope, 60 minutes or 55 minutes, it's whatever always. it is. Um, and obviously I always want to be respectful of of our guests' time. But yeah. Fran, is there anything else you want to add before we close out part two of the Fran Akunzo series? The only thing I'll say is the size of the market and the number of entries into the market. People say, whoa, isn't the market getting saturated? You brought it up at the beginning of this. It is yep. so not saturated. Mm -hmm. You know, you're looking at the fact, let's start with, if you had 100 med spots, 50 of them, they're not good. Now, yep. push them aside, 25 of them, they're not really doing it right. Another 25. Okay. Those are your competitors. That's who's right. in the market and playing it right. So don't look at the overall market. Look at the ones that are doing it right. And you do it right too. When you go to open your medical spa and you will be successful. That's it. That's all. Powerful all note to end on. I, I love it. I know our listeners are going to love it. We're always grateful to get you on the true to form podcast Fran. Um, we'll definitely do a part three in the future. So yep. thank you once again for coming on exactly. spending an hour with me. I mean, we covered a lot of ground today. So um, once again, just huge, huge thank you for coming on and being a regular guest good. on the true to form podcast Fran. Thank you, Audrey. Have a good day.